and we'll send these slides out to you. And as I say, I'm really going to be like super quick uh, because the magic is in what Andrew and Carol say. You would have, many of you might have seen the slides that we've developed in that, as I say, what Jazz covers, the definition of collective impact. So it's like from collective impact with real equity at, at its forefront in the new definition, which was awesome, uh, to the collective action that we've created in Aotearoa with our partners at the Tamarack Institute. So I'm hearing lots of that collective impact on the ground. What I'm really, really um, pushing is actually it's collective action with communities that is right for Aotearoa. So um, in the room that I've been in with the Federation of Primary Care, they're all talking collective impact. And I'm saying you need to be looking at the resources that are here and that are uniquely Aotearoa. Jazz will um, be able to talk about mindset shifts at, at um, follow on who is, but ultimately to start the journey of collective action, you really have to get in the right mindset. Uh, and it's a real paradigm shift. And so again, I'm not going to go into all of these aspects. Uh, I'll leave that for jazz. We have the six conditions of success. And now I would argue that um, in my learnings and in my experience that we do the what matters to Fano reasonably well. We, we don't have the balance of power around the leadership culture, Iwi Māori partnerships in terms of that collaborative government governance. And I think um, a personal opinion is there's not enough representation of lived experience, et cetera. And that's where the wellbeing wheel really comes into its own of like, actually, this is about our people. Um, the, we know sometimes the, the action plan that we create, get people get busy being busy, but then we fall down at places like metrics and backbone and continuous engagement. So again, Jazz is going to be the one person that will really bring this to life for your groups um, and, and across the sector. As part of that developing and, and listening and responding to the sector around really making sure that we've got that Hawada lens uh, a bit clearer, we revisited the roadmap that sits in the current booklet and actually wanted to make it more um, again, uniquely Aotearoa. So we really just wanted to highlight that. So we always use this, you know, kind of future is now, we see, succeed together. And it is our group that kind of makes things happen. So I'm going to hand you over to Andrew because, it, as I say, this is really was about giving you the context of the broader. Uh, I'm going to highlight that again for you, but Andrew can bring this to life beautifully because general practice will be an anchor partner within the new localities work uh, where collective action with communities can enable. So that's kind of where we're going to in a nutshell. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to go on mute and um, thank you for your patience. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Amajit. Um, do you want to put that um, slide back up with the wellbeing wheel just while you're at it? You've dropped it off. Um, I've uh, been on meetings almost continuously since about nine this morning, and actually a few of them have been regarding this exact topic. Um, I'm a GP in Northland. Um, I've been in my practice for 28 years now. Um, we've always been having a go at things that are new and innovative, and we were one of the earliest adopters in the country of the health games model, oh, which we pretty much take gone and done boots and all, uh, both for our self-survival in terms of uh, being able to deal with that urgent unplanned care, but also because it actually makes a whole lot of sense and patients love it. So it's not really hard once you start to want to keep doing it. Um, I work as a clinical lead and was was the DHB now in a te tai tōkere to Whatawara. Uh, I did one day a week in the health home space. Yesterday, my job was disestablished. I was told by Whatawara that I am surplus to requirements and that my knowledge and skill set is of no use to the health system and I've been disestablished, um, which is really interesting considering I'm sitting here talking to you and I worked till 5.30 last night doing all this. Um, fascinating, really, um, where they believe they're going to succeed if they're going to remove clinical leaders from uh, the space. Um, I'll keep you updated about that. Slightly gobsmacking. I did go as far as speak to the regional wayfinder who still said I'm likely to be disestablished, which is pretty weird. Um, Anyway, that's not going to stop me doing this stuff. I'm at it. Um, the stuff that, um, the background of this wellbeing wheel was really in that it seemed like 
a bit of a no-brainer. And I saw probably about three years ago a star used, I think in the UK, called a, a wellness star. And it had merit, but it was actually a licensed product and it didn't really fit the bill for, for New Zealand. And I've been talking about um, maybe we could do this ourselves. And I sat down one afternoon with Dr. Lisa Crosland, who's got a PhD and her uh, PhD was actually involved with delivery of um, rural general practice in Australia, both from a consumer point of view and a provider point of view. And Nikki Cantor-Bagain, who you would all remember, who was our lead up here and you know, quite an inspiration. The wheel you see took us a grand total of 45 minutes, of which probably half, half of an hour of that was laughing and making jokes about each other's expense. So it's not exactly um, the most prodigious bit of uh, work in terms of time frame, but it's got legs now. It actually is interesting, and I love to see presentations I saw a beautiful one coming out of Tora Compass, you know, to out of uh, Pyota work there with the wellbeing well smack in the middle of it. And yay for that. I mean, it's, that's absolutely lovely. I think Procure may be using it. I think a few of you liked it. Um, in fact, I don't know if anyone's from uh, Tora Compass actually on the meeting. They probably should be doing this presentation, not me, because they've taken this and run with it like, really, you know, beautifully. And intend to use this initially in their wellness plans out of general practice and then end up with um, having uh, a, a, a portal access, you know, the tool for actually people to own and do their own community navigation. The idea of actually people being owners of their own self-determined care, I would have thought is a no-brainer. And that's the idea of the well-being. Well, what matters to the person in front of me should be my first focus. And unless we do deal with what actually is going on for them there and then, there's no reason that we're going to bother to try and start doing stuff in the small physical health space and all, all mental health space that we work in general practice quite often. You would have heard me probably say before, my moment of truth with this is when I handed it to somebody and they circled big red on putty on their money. And I said, what's up with that? And they said, I've got a gambling problem, probably addicted. And I sent them to my health coach who organised them to go to Gamblers Anonymous. And they came back three months later and they said, got that under control now. That's awesome. Now, what was it you wanted me to do about my diabetes? And it was that simple as happens all the time now. Um, focus on what matters to people. They think they know that you're engaging, listening. And it's caring for people in a Caring. It's not to do with service delivery or healthcare, which is a bit of a misnomer. It's actually just, you know, it's caring. It's simple stuff to do. It makes people feel good on both ends of the equation. Now it's something that actually feels like you're doing your job right. Um, so this hopefully will eventually get embedded into um, the software down to order. But interesting for it's taken legs. So there's a process called RCCC that started up in North and it was to replace Jade, the mental health system. It then became the Regional Community Collaborative Care um, uh, work and it was going to replace all the mental health and most of the DHB community facing services in the whole Northern region. And it became apparent that probably that should be done nationally. So it's now become CCC. It's taken a life of its own. But as it's done that, the Wellbeing wheels turned up in the presentation of the vendor who is going to give us the solution. And in fact, it's the same vendor, I believe, that's actually doing the work in uh, Carpety Coast. So fortunately, the recognition is if we're going to do this, why are we going to do it more than once? So it sounds like the people doing the RCCC process are now going to deal with Torta Compass to actually empower the process down there because you've already done so much work on it. Uh, and, and then fold this back into HERA, which is a bigger national process of giving people portal access to all their information. So from that little old 45 minutes of sitting in the room and where this might end up, that's that's quite exciting for me to see that. Um, the Hopefully too, that um, it will be that we remove 
providers and GPs and just managers and other decision makers from whether people get this or don't get this. Um, at the moment, it seems, you know, I know this from patient portals, that decision whether someone gets a patient portal is usually dependent on the owners of a practice or the GPs within a practice or the managers who are going, well, we don't offer this or we do offer it, but not systematically, or we just don't want to do this at all. That, to my view, is something that we're just going to, it's indefensible. So this, I hope, will end up as a situation where well-being and portals and access to your own um, ability to do things is an opt-out, not an opt-on, so that you can do as much as you can with your whānau and yourself um, to make sure your well-being is maximised. Well, I've spent a lot of time trying to win hearts and minds of people over this stuff, and it's really hard to get people, they don't disagree with it, they like it, they like the look of it, but then to get people to use it is difficult. So if we give it to people themselves, they can use it, obviously. That, that it's something that gels with them and seems that it is when you actually show people this. It's simple enough. Um, and if we embed it into software and we embed it into the flow of work, so this is the first thing that pops up on the screen when you uh, someone is visiting any provider, then it becomes what we do. And the resistance might come from providers. Providers want to do this job. It actually feels right and it feels good. It's just going to come from commissioners and decision makers who often go, well, that's not how we do things currently. Um, so, uh, as I say, hopefully it actually is not something that um, we have to fight too hard for. It looks like it's got a bit of a role on by itself because it actually intuitively makes sense and seems to be um, something that we want to get done. Um, and I can't think that anyone on this call would probably think that's you know, something they wouldn't think is important. I'd like this for myself. And when I got really crook a few years back when I got my head and neck cancer, um, no one asked me anything on that wheel at all about anything apart from my physical health. Um, I did present that to the National Head and Neck Cancer uh, Service Review because I was actually on that as a consumer and they were going to put it into their head and neck cancer service platform because was recognition as if you've got quite a lot of stuff needs sorting. You know, you have to have transport to appointments, money to pay for medications, uh, what's happened to your employment, how are things at home, have you got a place to live? They saw it as something they wanted to use as well. Um, it's something I think that um, when anyone's got anything going on, particularly long-term conditions or something big going on in their life, then we have to remove the barriers to um, making it as easy as possible. You know, people are pretty stressed out as they are, and let alone um, making things harder for themselves. I wouldn't mind just actually even just stopping and opening up the floor because I'd rather, you know, in taking some questions or seeing what other th people think. I um, don't know how far any other regions have got with this. Wellington's powering along with it. Um, and whether you guys think this is something that, um, you've shown to people and met resistance or that you've actually shown to people and they've enjoyed you know like the look of it so don't know just uh, if anyone wants to make a comment go for it uh, yeah i've got a question andrew uh, the wheel looks amazing by the way it looks really really good but i'm just wondering you talked about portals briefly how do you respond to a general practice when they say they don't want to have a portal because, I mean, we will probably agree here that it's inexcusable. But, yeah, how can you respond to a practice without making them cross? <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, good question, Ali, because we've still got lots of, uh, I think that in New Zealand, I think it's still only 70% of people offer patient portal. So 30% of our practice aren't offering it at all. Um, and of those 70% that do offer it, I think the uptake on average is something only like 20% of people. So we're down to 14% of New Zealanders, and then only 8% of places offer it have open notes, and then to put one or two percent of people can read their notes. It's still driven by decisions of owners of practices. Um, and Ali, when you I guess when you go to them, you, I'd like to know why they aren't offering it. Um, when I did talk to practitioners about it in Northland. Every person in the room wanted it for themselves, but only about 30% well, at that stage or 
would offer it to their own patients. So it's a disconnection. And I think then when I ask them, why is it that you don't want to do it? They'll go, I don't know enough about it. I'm concerned about privacy. Um, it might lead to more work for me. People might um, you know, abuse it. I'm not quite sure about how I, you know, how I might be if I find results, what that would mean for people. So a lot of times it's just there's a, they've got questions that just require answering. Um, and I have spent a lot of time in the last few years answering those questions for people. Um, sometimes they're challenging their assumptions around it. And I think GPs are very defensive. We don't want to drop the ball, make mistakes, get things wrong. So one way of not getting things wrong is not doing something, you know, in that regard. Most of the upside of it is um, beats the downside. There is definitely a change in your workflow and workload if you embed it fully. But it's weird in my view in that what other industry, you know, is allowed to get away with this? I mean, banks offer internet banking. If you didn't have one internet banking, you wouldn't use it. Um, if you couldn't book accommodation online or flights online, you wouldn't fly or you know, use that company. This is something that patients are being blocked from having. I'm sure it's not good for their outcomes. And um, talking doctor to doctor helps Ellie. So getting a doctor who uses it and can answer those questions is helpful. But you know, there's an attitude out there that I don't think we're going to win hearts and minds of those people. So that's why we think about HERA and other solutions, which you know, don't care whether you want to offer it or not. We're going to give people all that information because it's not yours to withhold. Yeah, thank you. I, I think the open notes is a big thing that comes up in my discussions. And so, yeah, the, oh, well, yeah. We, let, we let anyone have their notes, but they're not prepared to have them open. Yeah, the yeah. open notes, you can. You don't have to open your notes, that's one thing. So you can actually, with portals, a lot of times, you can lock down all sorts of stuff you don't want. You can lock down so they can't message you. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you, know, you can strip down what you do offer. Um, the open notes is just not an issue. So if you roll on, if you sign up a bush road today, you'll get your notes back to 2014. So you get the last nine years of notes, whether I knew you were going to read nine years of notes or not. Uh, we're yet to have a complaint from a patient about our notes. I'm yeah. actually yet to hear a complaint from anyone in New Zealand about open notes that they've ever had any problems with them at all, not one. Yeah. So that's when you when it finally comes down to it is uh, it's a non-event. Yeah, that's been my experience too. But it seems as though you just can't tell some people. <laughs> no, I don't think you, don't think you can tell people. And I um, think even coming back to this well-being well. You people will look at that and go, I don't mind it, but I'm not going to use it. Um, that's why I think we've got to be looking at ways of taking that decision making away from the providers who decide what you know what goes on and passing it back to the people that matters there, which is Fano and, and make and, and people themselves to make them owners of the process. Um, I don't know how you, we where you guys are set, but many of much of this stuff is done by our nurses. They're done by in our core original care plus nursing um, who really like the idea of actually uh, populating their shared care plans with exactly this sort of information it makes goal setting easier it makes what people want easier um, and yet it's gps who are saying oh, i don't really want to do that shared care plan i want to use this process they're not even involved with it most of the time but they're still able to make decisions about blocking it which i think is going to be taken out of their hands at some point because it doesn't make any sense to me. And Andrew, can I just jump in? Sorry, Ali. Okay. I was just going to add to some of that. Um, uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, it's really good. And, and good question, Ali, because I think some of that fear that um, and the resistance, you know, actually is just people just do not see the, the value. Um, and I think if we can really elevate the stories of where people have found value, like you say, Andrew, connect to some of those GPs with other GPs who have used, um, you know, the portal and, you know, the difference it's made. And like you say, not just the GPs, nurses. So, 
um, you know, the more we can kind of elevate those stories and, and socialize those stories and, and actually, you know, really from a patient point of view, actually saying this is how it made a difference to me, mm. um, I think is, is, is also the way that we can kind of convert some of that, that thinking and take away some of that fear. I mean, it's, it's valid um, for a lot of doctors, you know, the, you kind of a lot of the news stories that we hear is privacy breaches. And so, you know, if we can, can begin a dialogue and actually start unpicking some of that, you know, also people will realize the value that it's, um, that it's bringing to a lot, you know, those people that are using it. Yeah. If there aren't any other questions, that we'll come back to that. Um, Carol, I think we could pass over to you and you can dive in and go for it. You're on mute, Carol. You're on mute, Carol. We can't hear you. Unmute yourself. While Carol's figuring that out, I no, she's just, got it. She's oh, she's got it. Cool. I was just going to say, there's something in the chat room from Nye. Um, I don't know if people can see that. Um, Nye from Toward Campus. It's I'll read it. It says, "Oh hi, well. it's oh, me. No, you hi, oh, nice. hi, Sorry, Jess. <laughs> That's okay. I just wanted to, um, uh, yeah, basically endorse the wellbeing law. I think it's been received really well here in Wellington. Um, so. Shout out to Andrew. I think it's it's really well made. Um, so we we kind of gave our network a bit of a taster of how this wheel wellbeing wheel could work, and part of that was that pockets of our organisation have sort of adapted that wheel and integrated, like Andrew said, into an online platform called Te Ara Pai Ora. Um, The way we see this is it's separate from patient portal. It's something that a that we could use as a tool for not just the enrolled population, but the non-enrolled population that aren't enrolled, because we've identified there's a cohort out there that don't have a provider that they could link up to for patient portals. So this is like a, a separate tool that they could use that's patient-driven. Um, so we are still in testing stages at the moment. So we're testing it without Carpety. I'm not part of the project, but I, you know, from what I can hear, our networks received that. Um, trial quite positive they see this as a really good opportunity for the patient to self-refer um, the patient to take control um, whether they want to share their content with their provider or not and even if they don't have a provider they've got this tool that they can self-manage in some way or another so it's a really good um, we've, in we've integrated the actual well-being wheel um, to a point where it feeds like a score um, in their app so that it gives you like a um, I don't know either a very limp flower or a very you know flourishing flower so it's a very um, creative way of trans transferring that idea yeah yeah so I thought it was really good to try and share that hope, yeah. hope I can give you a better update later when it starts going live but yeah we're working at um, integrating that with the PNE systems at the moment Okay. Would you like me to start now? All good? Sorry, Carol. Go for it, Carol. Fine. Kia ora koutou katoa. Um, Carol Coyne, tuku ingoa. Um, I would like to probably introduce myself because some of you don't know who I am. I've only been with OLAB for two months, but prior to that have been in primary care, which is Honestly, in the 30 years of my nursing career, being the most challenging, most rewarding, most versatile time of my um, nursing career, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. What Armadit would like me to talk about today is how we managed as a practice to connect um, effectively with our community. And I see Kirsty is on line here too from Kirsty Rudolph from Mahitahi, she was a part of that, so just wanted to acknowledge her. Um, so what, what happened in our, um, our practice at Tiki Ponga, we we're a healthcare homes practice, um, so everyone working at top of scope and using this fantastic wellbeing wheel, which um, is, is awesome. So really what we were facing through data was in COVID vaccination time, I just thought this was a really 
good example is that we um, were not vaccinating. We didn't choose to at the time due to most other practices, same thing, short of staff, um, well under the pump. But um, our figures were coming back and we had really massive gaps in, in who was getting vaccinated. It was our rangatahi and it was our um, age group between about 30 and 50, predominantly our Maori males. And so we decided what were we, what were we gonna do about this? We were really, really low. And we particularly had huge amounts of comorbidity even within that age group and particularly vulnerable um, from all these aspects in the wellbeing wheel and how were we gonna reach them? Um, they were our responsibility, they were our patients. So anyway, we went to our local iwi, our local marae and asked the questions, why was there resistance? What could we do to um, create a space that everyone would feel more welcome? And a couple of things came up to being the major issue, which is not a surprise to any of you. I'm sure you're all aware. One was trust and the other was access. And so um, where we were situated in Tikikonga is um, a car park, fabulous for parking, right by countdown. So we, um, and a lot of our community would come out during the weekend. So we looked into how we could create a space providing access and a place, a safe place for people to come. So we um, talked a lot to our queer and kaumatua and they were really pro-vaccination because they're the, they're the age group that saw the Spanish flu and our urupa and, and tuberculosis, polio. So they'd really been through a pandemic and they, our urupa are you know, littered, particularly with Māori throughout our nation of um, people who died during these pandemics. And so they were really motivated and really disappointed that the rangatahi, that the young people, that the tough, the tough boys weren't getting vaccinated. And um, I even spoke with one queer, she locked her door, none of her whanau were able to come into her house because they were not vaccinated. And um, on our vaccination clinic days, the whole family had to come, otherwise they would never see Nanny again. So there was some great work done within that. But back to how we did it, we then decided that they would be our monarchy, our support, they would have front of house, our, a team of about probably 10 older queer komatoa would come, sit outside, play the guitar, sing waiata, provide a cup of tea, we had, I'm not sure if any of you know Shirley Ann Brown, she is my sister-in-law. She was there to provide actual information, right information. And so we kept this all um, them and, and then inside they would come and they would be clinic, clinically have their vaccination. And then their waiting time after was back with Fano, back in, um, still with some nursing coverage, but back with people who they felt like they could really trust and share the experiences. The other thing we wanted to create was no pressure, that you don't have to be vaccinated, you're here to, have, to ask questions, to feel comfortable, maybe come back the following weekend. So we said like about six to eight weekends where we made this space available. And um, the uptake was phenomenal. But the neat thing about how the COVID, um, register was set is you didn't have to be registered within that particular practice and so we had lots and lots of drop-in particularly young people um, and had some really interesting um, experiences because of social media we had young um, rangatahi um, saying things like am I going to die um, if you give me this vaccination will I die you know that was um, a real thing that we had to work through Will I die? The other thing is, I'm just asking for a friend. Can I smoke weed um, after this? Can they smoke weed? Um, is it okay to drink? You know, these are real questions for our young people. And to be in that space where it was safe and um, obviously not highly encouraged, but, you know, we want them vaccinated. So, so there was a, a space, but through that relationship building within our, within our local marae, um, 
we were then invited as a practice onto the marae. So we shut the clinic early just to acknowledge the mahi that we'd done as a partnership and, um, and the fact that they invited us to do a um, vaccination clinic on the marae. So part of the protocol is that you have a porphyry. So instead of just a few of us who were going to vaccinate, we took the whole clinic. And um, we had lots of doctors who had come from um, India, England. Um, and so the whole team of us were then now welcomed into Pehi Awari Marae as part of their whānau. And um, that meant that we could come and go, that we could work alongside and be a team. So um, then we, then after that, we did a clinic on the Marae. So it's just, it's just been an incredible journey where we've been able to um, bring the two together, the general practice and our local Marae. And so now we can call upon some of the Komata and Kuya to come and pray, to have karakia when we have death, because again, the GP practices are becoming more like an emergency department, um, particularly in our area. Um, where people who are critically ill are turning up. We've had um, uh, babies brought in that aren't breathing. So th that's the opportunity where we can bring in our kaumatua to just pray and guide us through that process um, of how to handle some of these situations. And it's been incredible that they, have, they haven't got paid. They haven't we took a kuaha and a gift, a tonga, when we went to the marae. But these are people that have given up their time because they're so passionate about the health and well-being of their whānau and their community. In these pandemics, it's proven that the majority of, of our mortality is so much higher through our Maori communities to our non-Maori communities. And so um, they were really motivated to join and be a part of us. So that, that was phenomenal and um, something that I think will continue and is part of how we need to change the way we do things. Yeah, so I'm open for questions too because I think um, it is a new way of looking at doing things. We did have resistance from some of our staff, um, but I think what happened is they could see the, the benefits and um, when we didn't force all this change upon our staff, when we just let it evolve, um, everybody seemed to get on board. We practiced karakia once a week. Um, sorry, sorry, we practiced wiata so that when we went on to the marae, our team was prepared, knew what was appropriate. And um, it's all very well doing online courses, but when you actually put some of these things into action, it's a whole lot different. And you do get a better understanding when you've got the opportunity to experience something like this. Okay, kia ora. Hey, Carol, I've got a question for you. And actually, maybe I can open it up to the group as well. Yep. If we had a, using that sort of wellbeing approach, what, what would your team look like or what would your links look like or your referral processes look like uh, if you had the, you know, the perfect world, the sort of, situation where you're inside the clinic where I had all the support that you needed to make things hum around those determinants of care that we currently aren't really delivering. You any ideas about what perfect or good would look like for you? I think what the perfect scenario, because, uh, you know, like I was saying, was, the, um, was it the NIR that we operated out? You know how you, know how you don't, uh, um, that any person can be treated and accessed rather than being a registered patient. Because yeah. we're now doing like self-swabbing and we piloted that. I would just love the opportunity to be able to go onto a marae and talk to 200 women, all go and self-swab, done and dusted for the next five years. Do you know, so somehow in a perfect world, it would be amazing if we could be on one register. Yeah. That, I don't know if that answers your question, but to have all those resources, open notes, um, to be able to access, I think that would be amazing. Yep, I agree. And, and the fact that should be doable by a vision of having the information held by the person, you know, themselves. It's not it's not the NISR information, it's actually partly the person's information. And with any of those cervical screening registers, mammograms, anything you'd imagine, 
if it was appropriate and you had proper processes, you should be able to open up your app on your phone and you've done that, that swab, then the person's got edit, rights to edit it and say it's been done. I mean, I can't see why we couldn't do that. The reason the resistance is is because it's not the way it's currently done. Just thinking more of two care about what, what a team would look like. Because I often think about ourselves. I'd love to have someone in the practice that's a direct link to MSD or WINS. I'd like to have someone directly from North Tech. Or I'd like some so education. I'd like someone from Housing New Zealand as our go-to officer for housing issues. We had a health coach and health improvement practitioner, but they're still struggling to make that final link to what matters to people. So I'm not sure if anyone else in any other parts of the country have got, you know, their own bespoke wins officer that actually is part of their practice team. That's that's my future vision. Mm. I was absolutely um, amazed that you had NAS assessment within your practice. That is yep. phenomenal. I mean, yep. we wait, we wait six weeks to six months to get a NAS assessment. And, and so it's story. like I know it's amazing, but the story behind that, Carol, is it took us nine months to persuade the um, health of elderly people crew at the hospital to allow one of our nurses, a very NAS trained nurse, knew how to do into our assessment to actually fund her time to do them. They, for nine months, they blocked it. And yet they said, we've got a nine month waiting list for NAS. We said, we can do them on the patients within our practice so we know intimately we've got someone who can do it. And this is the sort of barriers to sort of basic integration, which are sort of beyond, it's sort of biggest belief sometimes. Mm. Mm. That would, yeah. In an ideal world, if we could just connect quickly and easily I mean we would save so much time and our patients would be able to be seen so much quicker mm. well I think a vision of a, a functioning locality would be that that you know your, your practice is only three k's from my practice and you know the group of north northland northern Whangarei practices would have our own part of our own team would be someone from WINS and from housing news and education NASC mm. health of older people POPs team, all the other services that are aligned to us. And we don't work in separate organisations. We work around the person in the middle who actually has got stuff that he's doing and it's seamless. Um, same with pharmacy. You know, Māori providers would be working, you know, we're all working as one. And to a degree, we're ready for it. You know, I don't know. We're, we as providers think, well, let's do this t today. Mm. But the powers that be are grinding along with us. I mean, that's the of paper vision of Wellington, but I can't see anything actually legs. And I guess that's um, which will probably pop in at some point and go, yes, yeah, exactly what we're trying to do as a collaborative. We're trying to find these solutions. We're trying to find ways of brokering those conversations and making, you know, collective action within communities, you know, work towards wellbeing. That's the whole aim of this organisation is to take what you guys are telling us and what we're hearing and make it a reality because we're responsible to the people we look after and we can wait as long as we like, but we know to date that health games wouldn't have happened unless we sort of pulled our finger and done it ourselves. And I think we've got the same feeling around the locality work is that we want that to work really well from the right for the right reason from the bottom up. So we'd like to take sort of that, you know, bull by the horns and actually start doing it, not waiting for other people to show us how it's done. Andrew, can I just add to some of that? That's really good um, conversation. So um, I think most, I'd, sorry, I didn't apologize for not introducing myself earlier. I'm Jazz Gruwal um, and I am a program lead for collaborative around collective action for communities. So this is an area I'm really passionate about. Um, and I have a background in social work. So all this rhetoric around, you know, serving the whole person, not just health, it's thinking about all their other, so the wellbeing wheel um, that you kind of have developed Andrew um you know I'm really excited about um, but I just wanted to kind of pick up a couple of points that you both Carol um thanks so much for your corridor around your experience in general practice and you know working with some of those communities that were if you like have been deemed hard to reach and you know the the way that you 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 worked with the community and you worked out something that worked for everybody because it wasn't just that Angatai that you were targeting you actually made, had you, you developed uh, an approach that benefited every single person 
person in that community and you've opened the doorway now for some amazing mahi that you guys can collaborate on. So um, that's really cool. But what I wanted to just kind of pick up is, um, Andrew, where you talk about, you know, you, you've got a nice service. There are pockets of excellence around the country, certainly in the areas I worked in Hutt Valley. Um, one of the areas, one of the populations that we were keen to, to work with and, and, uh, and serve better was our palliative care population. So within the Hutt Valley, actually across the three DH bays in the lower North Island, Cap Coast Hut and um, and Wairarapa is that there are these MDTs that include a whole uh, plethora of services that have input around um, it, it, around delivering the palliative care needs for patients. A lot of them were centred around older people, so they had an ask at the table. They had um, you know community services at the table, and they would review people who are on this kind of palliative care register, and they would ensure that their needs were met. What would what I'd love to see is to see that, and that is a, a very much around those kind of um, MDT meetings that the healthcare home model is promoting because what we want to do is, is deliver that kind of approach, not just with palliative care patients, it's for the population and that should be a standard for anyone that has complex health needs. And so where we have a, you know, a, 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 a mindset that's a lot approaching patient care in that whole of self um, and that whole well-being, only then will we, can we begin those conversations with those other services and those other agencies who are who are grappling with the same challenges. Um, if I think about MSD a number of years ago, um, uh, work and income, when they were work and income, when they moved into, um, what was it? What are they now? They are, I always call them, but they were wins, sorry. And then they became work and income. So what they did is they had these little kind of, um, one-stop shops that they set up so they got housing they got kind of other partners from the community they got some ngos they got the local um it, it, if i think about porirua they called our um one of our um final order services that were there and they were delivering services that were available for consultation what they did wrong is they set it up within a work and income setting. There was so much fakama with the population accessing those services. There was no way someone was going to go sit at a housing desk when they're there to talk about their money. So, um, but they were thinking in that way. But imagine if they took that same concept, as you're saying, Andrew, and put that within a general practice setting. That would just address so much of that kind of stigma that people would have had. So I'm really keen in terms of that. So, so where we're driving the collective action with communities approach, it's not just within the health sector. We need to be tapping into the other sectors, the social sector, MSD. I'm, I'm really keen to have conversations and i just kind of knocking on a few doors and slowly those doors are opening in terms of local government, MSD and justice, um, you know, even, you know, kind of some of our other community partners who are all just feeling like they're working a beaver in a way in their own silo and they, they're realising that actually they need to work with the whole whole of person and a whole of family um, and so they need to be partnering with others. Education is another one, um, you know, if we look at our, you know, our, our children, the number of children that are going to school without the things that they need to learn. So, you know, there's, there's, yeah, I'm quite excited by the opportunity about thinking about localities and thinking about communities and really elevating that kind of grassroots approach about delivering something that matters to the people. So sorry. <laughs> Uh, Bridget, you got anything you want to add? No, I was just giving a thumbs up. I was just giving a thumbs up because, yeah, just loving listening to the corridor and, um, yeah, even though I've missed some of it out of her mind, but, yes, just love listening to it and it's the direction we need to go in. So, yeah, um, but hopefully it's been enjoyable. I won't, I won't close us off, but I'll obviously leave you to ask more questions and then Jazz will clo close us off and then, um, yeah, I'll go quiet again because it's noisy. <laughs> I think that jazz what you're describing is um you know, he says pockets of excellence and how we we've done quite well with healthcare homes taking those pockets of excellence and then disseminating them you know because we've you know managed to uh, uh, and I are quite keen on stealing good ideas um the um the hope I would hope is that at the moment obviously there are some prototype localities around it'd be nice to find a place that wanted to start this from 
the ground up with no um, preconceptions other than the fact that they want to do this right because there is a right there's a process that will likely lead to the right outcomes and that's why we're I guess going on that study tour and talking to people and we've been spending time with Tamarack to find how you would do this if you wanted to do this well and um, I would have thought that if we do this well in some place that actually has got a population who need this and that's most of the country but some places have not got much support or existing um, resource and to get them up to speed in a high needs population or people that really need it most become an exemplar of what it looks like what true uh, community you know, collective action from community up looks like it's become a bit like you know a healthcare home model where there is a way of doing this so you want to follow a, a defined process that's going to yield the right results i don't see our current prototypes doing that because they've come from a different space with different vested interests and different relationships and i can't think that they're assessing their progress or their outcomes or their implementation in a way that is going to yield what we want but it's a, it's a sort of a challenge but i think it's actually quite nice i think it's to a degree the green fields in this space if we wanted to do this properly without would i be right with that arm and jazz or i'm just talking at a whole you're to totally right, Andrew, um, and, um, and, and I'm aware of the time um, that we kind of do, do need want to be finishing by two because I know people have kind of joined us during their lunch break. But you, what I would say, Andrew, is I think um, what we're trying to do is that really advocate for people to embrace, understand what collective action is and really embrace it in their communities. And, you know, it's so it's such a simple, easy, universal framework that anybody can take and you can apply it in a number of settings. It's not just around the localities. It can You can take it within a general practice setting and think about kind of ways that you can work with a community. As Carol demonstrated, that is collective action where, you know, going to the community, what is it they need, understanding what the issues are and then co-creating the solutions um but what was needed before you actually did that was that mindset shift so where carol described that actually some people were resistant and, and unsure it's about actually unpicking that and not forcing anybody it's actually it, th this is an offering and if people are aware and you know they have a desire to change then they will they will embrace it and i think the more we can the more people we can get on board with understanding what it is and what we're trying to achieve the more we we will see it just growing and we will just elevate those those, um, those pockets of excellence that do exist within our communities. So um, I'm just I'm thinking we've got a couple of minutes. Um, what I just wanted to is just do a little bit of a um, a bit of a promo around the, the workshops that I'm offering. So I'm doing um, well. I'm offering these two hours overview of collective action. What it is, um, why why it's why it's crucial in the current context of the health system transformation and I, I don't like to use a reform because actually what we're seeking to do is transform how we're delivering health care and so um, the two hours that I'm offering will cover off you know the, the relevance what it is how to do it well and some of the other offerings that we're kind of collective and um, collaborative Aotearoa Aotearoa is doing to to offer and, and guide and support um, communities as they journey through this 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 change um, so please just email me. There's some information on the website and you've all heard me talk about that. There's the online modules. But um, what I found as I've gone out to doing these overview workshops, they've just really started conversation and, and really kind of um, grown the, the excitement and hope. I think, you know, we can we can easily get lost in, uh, you know, the kind of um, the the we all see that the crisis, the burden on our staff, you know, the the negative outcomes. But um, yeah, I'm hoping that yeah that you know people can yeah buy in with this, so understand it, and actually see that yeah, it has relevance in 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 every area of healthcare and social care as well. So um, yeah, I encourage you to you guys to reach out, and if you're not sure, just even if it's just a quick chat to say you know. Ha how can and we can we can create something bespoke for your community depending where you are in your locality development journey um so yeah cool so is there any last questions and um Amajit's asked me because she's quite noisy where she is to, to close off with a karakia but does anyone want to say anything ask anything before we finish no Okay, 
thank you so much, Andrew, for, for making the time and actually, um, you know, giving us a, a bit of a nudge and, and sharing, you know, your, your story around, um, you know, your uh, experience and, and where this wellbeing world kind of came from. It. And, and it's awesome to hear um, the work that you're doing in, in your day to day work. I'm really sad to hear that there isn't, a, is, isn't work for you in your current role. But what I, I'd like to say is that you, you need to be at the table and, and I'm hoping there'll be something else that will emerge where because you have so much value to add Andrew so um, I'm hoping this isn't a farewell I'm, I, you, you'll just come up in a different in a different with a different title yeah um, and Carol thank you so much for sharing um, your, your experience as well I, I hope that's inspired other people um, as they're grappling with um, with some of their challenges in their areas as well so um, I don't have the, uh, we usually have a collab one, but I thought um, I'll just read Whakataka Te Ho, um, just as we um, end our working week and hopefully begin our week weekend shortly. So if you know it, um, feel free to join me. Whakataka Te Ho ki te uru, Whakataka Te Ho ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hi ake ane te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihe Māori ora. Thank you very much, Whanau. Kia ora. Well. Thank you. See ya. See ya.